Hi. Okay. So um, I just realized the video is going to be off um, during the presentation. So um, I won't necessarily know if you are kind of um, raising your hands with any questions, but the view that I got of the, the classroom made me feel very nostalgic. I haven't been in a classroom since COVID. Um, and hopefully one day I can uh, be there, uh, you know, with you guys. Um, so my name is Liz Jackson. Um, as Esther said, I'm a founding member of the Disabled List. I'm going to get a little bit more into that um, in a little bit. Um, but I actually, I wanted to start with a video that I'm going to share with you. Um, let me share my screen real quick. One second. Sorry. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. So can I, um, can everybody see my screen okay? So we're looking at, if you can't see it, just make a noise. Um, but what we're looking at is we're looking at a, a tweet. Um, and this tweet was actually written in 2019. It's a couple of years old. But um, the reason I'm pulling this up is because one of the main things that I think about uh, when I encounter a disability design is I like to ask myself, how does something make me feel? Um, and so I'm hoping that when we watch this video together, um, you'll ask yourself the same thing. Um, you know, how does this make me feel? And the video, the tweet says, we're super excited to introduce Lego Braille Bricks, a new product from the Lego Foundation uh, that will help blind and visually impaired children learn Braille in a playful and inclusive way. So I'm going to play that video for you real quick. And again, as I'm playing it, just think about how it makes you feel. So, you know, we're listening to the music. The music is, there's usually like a tinkering of a piano. So the music's usually pretty upbeat. Um, and I'm imagining that you are feeling or you're at least expecting to feel some level of um, empathy, um, maybe a little bit inspired, um, you know, just feeling like this is a positive thing. Okay, so I wanna watch um, a little bit further. And as we're watching, I wanna, I want you to think about, well, if you were blind, how would this make me feel? Probably not very good, right? I mean, how would, how would a blind person even know what's in the video? And this is really, you know, a lot of, of what I have been asking over the last few years is, is who are these initiatives? Who are these, these things actually created to reach? And who are they intended for? Because that video was not intended in any way for the, the blind children that it was ostensibly about, right? And so for me, the thing that I really like to get people thinking about is when I encounter something disability related, something disability design related, um, just start with how does that make me feel? And then from there, use that as an incentive to dig a little bit further about what is actually going on here. Um, in the case of Lego Braille Bricks, for me, when I saw it and I realized I was supposed to feel good, um, I started digging a little bit further. And I learned a couple of things. The, 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 the main thing I learned was, is so back in the 1980s, there was this family that created um, this product. It was called, um, what's it called? Um, tactiles. And what the, it was a father of a blind son and he, he got Legos and he would sort of cut off a couple pieces of the Legos and he would turn them into bricks that were Braille. Um, and through that, they developed this into a company called Tactiles. And the Tactiles was this company that for decades was beloved um, amongst blind families, blind children. Um, but they were very expensive because oftentimes you can't really get investment in products that are intended for blind people, especially when those products can't really be broadened to like benefit everybody. Um, and so I think tactiles for many years cost $700 to purchase. But even still, 
um, they were able to, you know, stay in business and they were able to fundraise and they were able to get these into the hands of families that really needed them so that their children could learn Braille through these tactiles. So when Lego Braille Bricks came along, um, they developed it through the Lego Foundation. And in order for a child to get their hands on some Braille Bricks, they didn't actually have to pay any money. Um, they would just have to contact their local um, organization and then they would be sent to them for free. And um, because this wasn't actually a Lego product, they only made a limited amount. Um, I think there are still some available, but they're not going to be available forever. And when they run out, they're out. And in doing so, in creating and in, in, in changing this product from something that was a commercial product to a charitable product, they essentially put the tactiles family out of business. Um, and in putting the family out of business, there is no longer a sustainable resource or a sustainable um, way to have this product last for generations, right? And so oftentimes these do good initiatives, um, the, there can be something a little bit more sorted under the, the surface. Um, and so you really kind of need to dig and ask questions. And that's really what a lot of my work has been over the last few years. Um, so I'm gonna cut over to this next um, screen share. So as I said, I work, um, at the disabled with at the disabled list with um, Alex Tagard, um, and one of the things we realized was is that when um, somebody that works in um, a, a creative agency or works for a corporation or is a student, um, oftentimes they will get a design brief, and in that design brief, um, they will be told that you, you need to design for disability and there's something very obvious that happens when they get that brief. The first thing that they do is, is they go online and they Google, you know, design for disability. And, you know, it's like, what's the first thing that comes up? Well, the first thing that comes up isn't actually the things that disabled people have been saying about disability design. What comes up are brand depictions of their interactions with us. And so Alex realized that in order for us to um, shift the way that design is done, disability design is done, we actually needed to create um, a repository of disability representation in media, right? Because we actually had to shift the stories that were told about design so that we could shift the way that design is done. So we created this resource, it's called Critical Access. Um, you can go through and we've we've just sort of, right, we've tagged everything, we've categorized and cataloged everything according to trope. And we've learned so much from, from this, uh, this sort of database. And you can go through and each of these different ads uh, and designs has um, a whole analysis. And um, I'm not like the smartest person in the world, but at a, a certain point in time, someone pointed out to me, they realized, well, like, you, do you realize you're actually making a database? And I, I didn't quite realize that. Um, and once I did, and I realized how powerful it was, one of the first things I did was, is I went onto YouTube and I went for all of these videos and I, um, I counted the amount of words that disabled people spoke. And then I went through and I read the comments and I would categorize and catalog the comments. And one of the first things I learned was, is that the more words a disabled person speaks, the less believable an ad is perceived to be. So that's you know a really powerful thing to learn. And so there's a lot in here and, and we kind of get into it in the different analyses, but um, a lot of my design work has actually been um, focused again on brand depictions of their interactions with us and, and sort of design depictions of their interactions with us. And so that's really what I'm gonna spend time um, with you guys doing today. Um, so, Sorry, I'm not very good at um, shifting from one screen share to the next. Um, so I think before I get into the sort of the next depiction, um, is there, uh, does anybody in this class, do you guys have any sort of background in disability studies? Um, if you could like make a noise. Okay, there's no noises. <laughs> so I want to kind of get in a little bit into a little bit of disability basics with you just to kind of make sure that we're coming at this from the same place. So the first place I want to start with is um, disability language. Um, and I'm, I want to kind of look at this in three different ways. So the first way is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase people with disabilities. Uh, versus disabled people. 
Um, but these are the two ways that you can reference someone that is disabled. Persons with disabilities, people with disabilities is considered person first language and disabled people is considered identity first language. So the, the background on people with disabilities is really interesting. Um, so back uh, at the height of AIDS, um, in the AIDS crisis, uh, a, a lot of like just everybody was being told don't touch someone that has HIV, you know, stay away, don't even be in the same room. And so people that had AIDS were just advocating for their very basic personhood. Um, and so they came up with this term and it was people with AIDS. It was their person first language. And what it did, what it was intended to remind people of their humanity, of their personhood first. Um, and that that framing person with AIDS was then adopted into disability spheres. And it was initially very liberatory. Um, and so you, you got person with disability. And again, it was intended to do that same thing, right? It was intended to remind people that they are a person first. Um, but then person with disabilities got taken up by systems of power. So that would be medical systems, right? The clinic, um, hospitals, doctors got taken up by schools, parents and teachers and charities got taken up by the government. And so what, be, because of the, 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 the ways in which it was taken up, it became this thing that you must do. It became a form of compliance. And compliance and disability is sort of a very tenuous topic. I tend to stray away from compliance and I'm happy to get into that as well. Um, but I'll give you an example. I um, So I refer to myself as a disabled person. I refer to myself um, in identity first language because I believe that, um, because I'm doing liberatory work, because I'm trying to put um, justice in front of right my own personhood. Um, I flew out, um, the Sydney Opera House flew me out first class. I did a presentation. I actually, I spoke between Ronan Farrow and Tana Hase Coates. In the presentation, I referred to myself as a disabled person. Afterward, I got off stage and this woman walks up to me and she says, you got it wrong. Here in Australia, we refer to disabled people as persons with disabilities. And I couldn't believe it. Like she had no idea. And so the, there's this insinuation that in, in this way in which if you don't say people with disabilities, if you say disabled people, you're still corrected to this day. Um, and again, that's because of the systems of power that took it up and that it became this thing that you must do. Um, and there's really interesting dynamics in it. Like Again, if you refer to yourself as a disabled person, you might get corrected and be told, no, that's a person with disability. But if you refer to yourself as a person with disability, um, then the like someone who identifies as a disabled person won't correct them and probably it, but like it, it's a sign to them of like sort of who they're dealing with. Um, and so there's been this sort of interesting splinter where people with disabilities still, is is used by the, the like these great systems of power. Then you have like the like the liberatory justice people in the middle, and then you have um, people that have intellectual and developmental disabilities who still are advocating for their personhood, and and because of that, they do still use person first language. And so there's there's not an easy way to actually like clarify who uses what language at what time and for what reason. And the reason I tell you all of this is because dis what disability design has taught us is that everything is incredibly simple, right? Like you get these sort of, you know, stories that that they, they just, they tell you a simple story. They're like, well, there was this problem and we fixed it. Um, and, you know, doesn't it make you feel good? But the reality is that there's so much complicating all of that. Um, and so, you know, it's like, it's for me, even though I can't necessarily help you fully understand the scope of what gets said and when, what I want you to understand is that it's complicated. All of this stuff is, and that there are resources that are available. Um, and, you know, I'm here and, and others are here if you decide that you're going to delve into disability design. So with that sort of murky confusion, I'm going to kind of get into one more. And I'm going to explain how that one gets complicated. 
Um, and then I'll delve more into some of the the kind of stories that um, are brand depictions that I think have been really interesting. So there are two primary models of disability. There is the medical model. And the medical model states that a person is disabled by their bodies, right? So um, a medical body, uh, the medical model sees the disabled body as something that needs to be cured, um, that is something that is impaired, that it is within the person. Um, and then contrary to that, you have the social model. And the social model doesn't see that a person is disabled by their bodies. They see that the person is disabled by the world around them. And I actually don't really ascribe to either, um, and I'm not going to get into why there's sort of this emerging model. It's called the complicated model. Um, but I wanted to explain how like this plays out in design practice. Um, again, just so you can get an idea of like how the, these things merge together and blend and kind of morph into one another and get murky. So um, more and more you find designers that are very aware of, of what these models are and, and someone who has made themselves aware of these various models is probably gonna be operating on a more liberatory tra trajectory than another designer. And so they'll tell you, they'll say, you know, I'm operating within the social model, right? And, and they realize, okay, well, if a person is disabled by the world around them, then that is something I can design a solution for. And so, right, they're, they operate within this medical model and they try and design a solution. You know, maybe it's, um you know, something on a screen, like, you know, alt text or whatever. Um, so what happens is, is they create a beta and then they need people to test it out. And so what they do is, is they will go onto social media and they'll try and recruit and they'll say something like, you know, I'm looking for people who are blind or low vision. And what that does is, is right. So they've created this thing that is it's intended to address the barriers that the disabled person experiences, but then as soon as they go to recruit, they're looking for people that that are disabled by their bodies that operate in the medical model. Um, and so a lot of the work that we've been doing at the disabled list is trying to get designers to stay within the model in which they're operating. And so, you know, instead of, you know, if you've created something on a screen and you need people to test it out, instead of saying, are you blind or low vision, we'll instead say, are visual elements of this screen inaccessible to you? And what that does is it actually opens up the pool of people that you that you might actually want to test this on. For instance, I don't identify as blind or low vision, but I get um, their migraine auras called scintillating scotoma. They're these weird sort of morphing blobs that they're like black holes that go across my vision. And wherever it is in my my line of vision, I'm completely like I can't see through it, but everything around it is distorted. It's it's just this weird thing that I experience from time to time. And so whereas I don't identify as blind or low vision, and I would never answer yes to are you blind or low vision, I might, if I'm experiencing scintillating scotoma at that time, I might say that no, there are visual elements of this that are not accessible to me. And then suddenly, right, like there's all these different new perspectives which, with which you can kind of work with them. And then, you know, if if you want to take it a step further and kind of really understand, you know, a, a more sort of cultural perspective of disabled people, you could just simply ask the question instead of are you blind or low vision or are visual elements of this accessible to you, you could actually then just go and ask, um, what do visual elements of this mean to you? And I think that's when you start to get into like the really interesting stuff. Um, so I'm gonna just pause for a quick second. If anybody has um, any questions, maybe you could make a just a quick noise. Um, otherwise I can kind of keep yammering on. Okay, so I'm going to um, jump into this, this next screen. Uh, screen share one second. Okay. Um, so here, this is a product example of something that was recently designed. Um, it was designed by Oil of Olay. Um, and I actually first encountered it because I think they had taken out this like full page um, ad in the New York Times, and there was somebody 
very high profile that was like, this is amazing. Um, and I was like, hold up, like, let's just think about this for a second. Um, let me see if I can find a picture. There's not two, so there's sort of a picture of it here that you can see. And basically what it is, is, um, so this is called Olay's Easy Open Lid. And what this model is holding in her hand is there's a, a red bottle uh, or red glass jar that's filled with face cream. And then on top of it, there is, it's a cap and the cap has two wings. And then on top of the, the cap uh, is some braille. And again, the question that I ask myself when I encounter something like this is, how does this make you feel? And also like, who is this for, right? Those are the two things that I'm asking myself. So I've got, you know, this, this lid, this Olay Easy Open lid. And in here, I don't know if it's on this website specifically, but in the initial description, what Oil of Olay says is that they had two user groups. Um, and those user groups were um, mobility, dexterity, and um, blind people. Those were the two user groups that they wanted to solve for. Interestingly, whenever you get packaging, it's always those are the those are always the two the two kind of um, segments that that they're always solving for in terms of accessible packaging. Um, and you know, I thought it was interesting. You know, there, I don't know if this solves a problem because you know there's questions around shelf space or whatever, but it makes a good announcement. And what happened was is Olay. Um, if you ordered the, any of these, there's four possible face creams, uh, which they show here. If you order any of these four face creams on the website, then you get a pop-up and the pop-up says, do you want the easy open lid? Um, and it immediately raised some questions for me, right? Like, I think that the wings on it are actually useful. Um, but the question for me is with the braille, right? So you have something that you're receiving in the mail to put on a bottle. It's the same lid for all four of these bottles or these all four of these jars, right? The lid doesn't change. Um, and it's such a unique shape that it it's almost like it under it underestimates the the blind consumer. They they think that a blind consumer is gonna feel those wings and need further clarification about what this product is. I think the I think the braille reads face cream on top or something. It's actually almost exactly the same strategy that uh, Degree Deodorant took when they made, um, it was the Degree Adaptive uh, Deodorant. And they their bottle had this sort of fascinating hook curved lid. And it was just, it was just this large bottle that like anybody that touched it, like, you know, would know what it was. And I think on it, they had degree written in, in it was either degree or deodorant written in Braille. I could never quite tell because the only letter I could see was the letter D and so it could have been either word. Um, but it's like, okay, well, if the Braille isn't actually serving a function for those blind users, like who, who is that Braille actually for, right? In, in this way, what you realize is if you put a couple of wings on a cap, it's not gonna read as inclusive. So you need a visual signifier of inclusion so that these brands can sell this story. Um, and so right, these are kind of the questions that, that I like to ask. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing and then share one more thing that I think is really important to this story. Um, okay, sorry, I'm really bad at this. Okay. Go back here. Okay. So here, oh, here we go. So here's the, um, this is the press release for the Olay's Easy Open Lid. Um, and there you can kind of get a better view of, of what that the product looked like. And you have the wings and you have the braille. Um, but when you go down, there's this paragraph here that just like was so interesting to me. And so the paragraph is, says access accessibility makes things better for everyone says journal and model madison lawson who is living with muscular dystrophy she is one of the key members with whom olay worked closely with to bring this jar to life everyone's been there where you get a product on your hands and you're trying to open um something and you can't so i think it's cool that this is designed with us specifically in mind but it also makes everyone's life better 
So what you have in this paragraph is you have Oil of Olay saying that Madison Lawson is one of the key members of this team. And then she's, Madison is saying that it was designed with us in mind. So she's saying it was, it like she wasn't like it, she wasn't on the team. And so this actually for me is raises a really important question about um, who like who gets credited, who really benefits from these product products and projects um, and sort of who gets used, I guess. Um, sorry, one second. So one of the things, I'm trying to figure out the best way to kind of explain this. So I had this experience once where I was a finalist for this, um, it was something called the David Prize here in New York City, I'm, or in New York City, I'm not sure if, if you're aware of it, but um, they they bring in like, you know, sort of like 20 finalists and then like, you know, like five or six of them will get a lump sum of money. Um, and as part of the the David Prize, what they wanted was they wanted each of their finalists to do a public facing event. And I told them I wasn't really comfortable doing a public facing event because um, I felt that it would be tokenizing. And so instead, I offered to do an accessibility audit of their website. Um, and they thought about it and they're like, well, we're really not comfortable not paying you to do that. But we have this other thing that we were um, hoping you might be willing to help us out with. So there was this interesting thing that happened at the beginning of COVID, uh, which is that, so the David Prize really likes to get um, marginalized uh, applicants. And in order to get the people that they want to apply, they need to have a, a means to apply. Um, but at the beginning of COVID, uh, libraries were shut down. And so a lot of the people who wanted to apply didn't have access to a com computer. And so they decided, so they couldn't apply. So the David Prize realized that they wanted to create a more accessible way for people to apply. And so what they did was um, they created an SMS app, like a, a bot that you could text. Um, and they asked me, they said, you know, we've created this, this app. Um, will you test it out for us and let us know what you think? And I was like, sure, I can do that. Um, you know, this is what I was going to do instead of that public facing event. And so they gave me the number and I just texted it and I said, you know, hi, I'm interested. And it writes back and it's like, it says, what's your name? I give them my name. And then it writes back and it says, um, it, it's like, it's like a text longer than like my grandma would send. It was like six paragraphs. Um, and it wanted to, to know what my idea was, but it, it basically said, okay, so this is, you know, these are the questions for each one. You have 1500 characters that you need to respond within. Um, and also this might be difficult to do over text. So you might want to type it out on a computer and then send it to yourself and then text it to us. And I was just like, I was like, this is absurd. Like this is even more inaccessible than the, than, you know, just emailing it or, or doing the application on a computer. So I was, I sent it to Alex, my, my work partner, and we were just kind of like laughing and making fun of this. But then like we honed in on this really good idea, which is that, you know, like these, a lot of foundations expect people who apply to have fully formed ideas, but also increasingly foundations are trying to reach people that haven't traditionally been eligible for foundation funding. Um, and those are people for whom they don't have the privilege of actually having a fully formed idea because they don't have any resources, they don't have time, it's just simply not possible. And so we started to realize like, well, what if you did create this bot app and instead of asking the person to send a fully formed idea, what you could do was you could um, say like, do you have an idea? If so, what is it? And then like the, the bot could write back a week or two later and be like, are you still thinking about this? How has your thinking changed or evolved? How has your idea evolved? Um, and it could just do that over a period of a couple of months. And then that would actually serve as the person's application. Um, and then you would have something to test it against, right? Because you could then test it against the website and you could see, okay, well, which mode of application is actually yielding more finalists and winners? Um, so I wrote back to the David Prize after I had, um, you know, had this conversation with Alex and I sent that to them. And they wrote me back and they said, um, thank you for your feedback. And I was just like, huh, 
was like, did they really just thank me for my feedback? Like, did I actually get thank you for your feedback? Because the thing that I've come to understand as a, a disabled professional doing work in spaces that are trying to become inclusive to disability is that when you are thanked for your feedback, that's essentially the end of the conversation. It's a conversation ender. You know, when when someone is thanked for their feedback, they're basically told that the knowledge, like that by the system of power, that the knowledge and lived experience that they just brought to them, that they have lost control over how that's going to be used. Um, and so I've really started to see thank you for your feedback as this, um, it's for me, it's like a, a power litmus. Like you can be in a situation where you think that you're equals with someone. And then the second they thank you for your feedback, you're like, oh, okay, now I understand where I reside in this. And so, you know, um, I, I was kind of, I was really upset about it. And then I was thinking back and I realized that when they had actually gone to send me the SMS bot, um, they didn't ask me for my expertise, right? They asked me if I would test this out, right? And so side to my disability work, I'm actually really, really interested. I grew up in a sports family. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was following, um, I don't know if you're aware of um, the NCAA Supreme Court case where um, student athletes were, um, suing to have rights to make money as, as students. Um, the background on the, the the designation of a student hyphen athlete, so a student athlete, it started in the 1950s when the NCAA needed a special designation of athlete that they could create so that they wouldn't have to pay their students. And that's how they came up with student athlete. Um, and it, it just struck me as something that was really interesting. And something that I started to realize was is a lot of the logic around student hyphen athlete or as I started to call it, hyphen status, also applied to disability design. And what that is, is, is whatever comes after the hyphen, right? So in student athlete, it's athlete that comes after the hyphen. So whatever comes after the hyphen is systemically uncompensated, um, doesn't operate within the benefits of the institution, and is, is exploited for their labor. Um, so in disability, like who does that apply to? Well, it applies to a user tester or a user expert or a patient expert or uh, a co-designer or a co-creator, right? It doesn't matter what falls after the hyphen, right? Designer, creator, expert, tester. That role is systemically uncompensated. Um, the person has no agency over how they use their labor. And so what I realized again in that was that, oh, like I had fallen into this sort of hyphen status bucket. And so when we think back to that Madison quote, right? You can tell what her role in this was, was not as someone that had agency, but as someone who was thanked for her feedback. And so her feeling in response to it was to not actually think that she was an active participant in this process, that, that she had any say, and that this was actually something for her. And I think that has huge implications because, um, like for Alex and myself, you know, when we engage in a research process, the thing that we realize is, is that um, and it, if I'm like getting too far off here, you can just like start making noises and I can kind of shift back to other stuff. But I, this is like, you know, what's really important to me um, and has been for years. So when we, when we're engaging in a research, research process, right? So we we're, we're doing some research for a large corporation and we realize that there's really two reasons why a disabled person would um, fill out a screener. Um, one of the reasons might be that the disabled person, we have built trust, Alex and I have, um, and that that disabled person wants to support us. Um, maybe they have interest in the topic, um, but that they don't necessarily want anything out of it. And then there's the other reason. And that reason is that um, the disabled person um, doesn't have any other route into employment and they are um, looking for a foot in the door, right? And I think so often in research processes, especially by these sort of large corporations or, or institutions that have a lot of money, um, I think they like to pretend that the latter doesn't exist, that, that people aren't actually looking for opportunity um, 
And for me, what I'm trying to figure out is how is it that you can start to engage in research that embraces that? And how is it that you can professionalize things that have historically been granted hyphen status and it have caused people to be thanked for their feedback? How is it that you can um, offer in return for a disabled person's knowledge something that they can put on their resume, right? Like, I think that those things are absolutely vital because, you know, I to say in disability right now, there's so much design for disability happening, but nobody's actually doing the one thing that disabled people want, which is figuring out a way to get disabled people meaningfully paid. Um, and so, you know, like that's something that I think would make for a really in interesting design project. Um, so I want to share sort of a student example of some of these dynamics that play out. And again, I think I just think that these are things that are really important for you to know, especially if you're going to be doing projects, not only with disabled people, but people that are sort of otherwise marginalized. Um, OK, so I'm just going to close out these tabs so I don't kind of get um, stuck. OK. Sorry, one second. Really bad at this. OK. Okay, so in this, this is um, a, just a story that was written by Model D. I think that it's like a local Detroit press and it just caught my attention, right? Detroit, Detroit students design accessible products from menstrual cycle apps to better walkers, right? So you scroll down um, and you see here um, that in a product design class, Students are given a simple yet broad prompt, design a product for a disabled person. Then the class went on to discuss the barriers. Um, and then from there, they let research design and of course their imaginations do the rest. So, right, this is an incredibly broad prompt. Um, a little frightening that like their imaginations are playing such a role in this so early on. Um, but let's see where it gets us. So. You know, and yeah, I was going back and forth about whether or not to share this um, example, but I, I think it's just such a good example. Um, it's a little awkward, but also, right? We were told up here we're going to see where they let that we're going to let their imaginations do the the rest. Um, and so then we're we learned about Grace Baker when she thought about blind people. Her mind went to women, women like her, and wondered how accessible menstrual products are. Um, like that's where her imagination went. And this is like another thing is, is like the the things that people are curious about with regards to disabled people are um, a little horrifying. And this sort of lets us in like, so I'm every year I get at least a half a dozen students approach me about doing projects around disability sexuality. Um, and it's just, it's like, you know, I think people are like fascinated, like how, how do disab disabled people have sex? Like, you know, it's sort of, you know, bound to come up, but this is, so this is a story about um, menstrual products. Um, and I think this is really important because um, I wanna focus on her research process here. So uh, Baker interviewed three women, one was colorblind um, and couldn't see the color red, but she knew, um, so what we know is, is that there was a woman who was colorblind that was one of the women that Baker interviewed. Um, and then the woman goes on to relay a story about the first time she got her period. Um, and in this, the girl saw something dark in her underwear and she didn't know if it was her period or not. So she had to actually ask her mom. And for me, there this kind of leads us to something that happens all the time, especially in design school. And I, I want you to be so aware of it, which is that when you start interviewing um, disabled people, I think for the most part, disabled people want to be really helpful. And so they will um, try and work with you to find a tangible problem that may or may not actually exist. In this experience, in, in this story, the tangible problem is something the woman relayed from many years before because, you know, like there's, she probably doesn't have an issue with the color of her period now that she's, you know, had her period for, for many, many years. It was just that first time. Um, 
But more than that, it's actually not a problem. A lot of people, a lot of um, people who get their periods the first time, it's not as red as they would expect. And so they don't, they don't actually know if that is um, blood or not, right? And so, and again, it's super awkward to talk about, but what this did was, is this one anecdote that isn't anything to do with colorblindness um, that was told to this student by um, a disabled person who was trying to be helpful, then kind of goes down this trajectory of like, you know, like then there's like a whole product that's sort of created around that one sort of anecdote. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think for me, you know, it's, it's, it also kind of plays into this sort of deprofessionalization. Like she, you know, she's very clearly interviewing a grown woman and like, this is the story that gets told of that woman, right? Like, why would that woman want to put anything about that on her resume, right? Like this is, you know, the ways in which I think disabled people really do get, you know, sort of manipulated. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything more I want to add to that. Um, so, and it, it like, it happens again, it happens all the time. Um, and I wanted to kind of show like where this leads to. And so I think like, this is sort of the thing that I've kind of become the, like sort of the most notorious for in, in this field. So I got really frustrated a couple of years ago by this dynamic that always happens. And I'm going to pull up this example of it. Um, So this is a tweet that was written by the New York Times Health. Um, and they say, you know, they, they post their story and they say, remember Google Glass? Well, Stanford University researchers are exploring whether it can help teach autistic children to make eye contact and recognize their emotions, right? So again, we go back to that, who is this actually for and how does it make you feel? Well, like, you know, it, it might seem sort of like awe-inspiring and amazing, um, but then you scroll down to the comments. And you have Laura say, why not focus on getting non-autistic people to accept differences in social communication rather than forcing autist autistics to conform? Eye contact, eye contact can be painful and it's not necessary. John Marble says, what the fresh hell is this bullshit? Um, can you not force people to make eye contact? I mean, like you can just sort of like work your way down more and more and more. And so, you know, and there like, there's other ones, like the, another notorious one is um, the stair climbing wheelchair. Um, where, and it happens a couple times a year, there'll be a design firm or a design student somewhere that creates a wheelchair that can climb steps and, uh, you know, design or you know, like another design, you know, fast company will post about it and, um, you know, sort of speak about it in glowing terms is this amazing innovation. And then you get all the disabled people in the comments saying, we don't, like nobody can afford this we don't want innovation, we want infrastructure, right? Like disabled people are saying, like wheelchair users are saying, we don't want a stair climbing wheelchair, we want ramps and elevators. Right? Like why can't we celebrate ramps and elevators? And so I created this term and it's called, it's the term is a disability dongle. And it's just like, again, it was, I wanted to speak to the absurdity of it. And as I describe a disability dongle, it's a well-intentioned and elegant yet useless solution to a problem we never knew we always had. And right, the, the disability dongle, it ranges from the stair climbing wheelchair to the um, to the sign language goggles. The, another big one is, um, or uh, the eye contact goggles. Another one is uh, sign language gloves for deaf people. Um, and they're always just met with absolute rage by disabled people. Um, and the thing is, is the, the goal of sort of like, sort of making an amusement out of this thing that happens time again, time and again, isn't to scare people off of doing work with disabled people. It's, it's about trying to figure out how is it that we can start to do things differently. And so for that, um, I want to share with you this, and this is something that Alex and I wrote, um, I think a year or so ago. Um, and these are the questions that we really want disabled designers, especially students, to be asking themselves. Um, and I know it's about partway down the list, but for me, the most important question in here is, 
Who are you trying to impress with this work? Um, because for us, the thing that we realize is, is when somebody creates something like a stair climbing wheelchair, at some point in that process, they stopped actually listening to that disabled person that was granted hyphen status, uh, that disabled person um, who was thanked for their feedback. That's probably, thank you for your feedback is probably how they stopped listening to them. Um, and they just sort of continued on the path that they were going on because they felt like they had something really important they wanted to do. But the thing was, is if the person that they were actually trying to impress wasn't someone that was going to read their resume or, you know, someone that was going to read a zine, if that person that they were trying to impress was actually the disabled person that this product was ostensibly for, the product would have never been made in the first place, right? And so we actually, you know, we when we teach, we teach our students about the value of abandonment, right? How is it that you can start to recognize the moment at which the thing that you're working on is causing harm? And at that moment, what can you do to abandon? And what I've come to understand is, is that when you abandon something before you've announced it, um, it can actually demonstrate a greater commitment to the community, to the, the people that the product is ostensibly for. And so, you know, if there's one thing that I, I hope if, if, if this against list becomes a resource for you, there's one thing I hope it can instill in you is this, this confidence and this willingness to abandon. Um, when we teach our classes, we don't actually grade our students on whether or not they turn in a final project, uh, whatever that assigned final project is. What we grade them on is did they decide to abandon at the moment that harm revealed itself. And for students that decided to abandon, they just needed to turn in an ex explanation of the harm and why they abandoned. And there are many students that have actually gotten much you know, better grades for abandoning their project than seeing it through. But in this list, right, some of the questions that you know we ask are, uh, you know, what are some things I know about disabled people and their experiences and where did I learn these things? Um, I had a friend write me last week um, and she said, um, and her boyfriend teaches uh, a, a design course. And in the design course, the students were supposed to pitch, it was like an architecture idea. And one of the students pitched an architecture idea um, for a building for blind people. And the student got through the pitch and the, the teacher, who's my friend's boyfriend, uh, said, um, did, you know, did you talk to any blind people about this? And the student said, no, I just, you know, just use the knowledge that I've learned from, you know, movies and stuff. And my friend's boyfriend, the teacher again said, well, you're really lucky that you have me as a professor because a lot of other teachers would have just patted you on the back for this. He said, but my girlfriend is blind and, um, this is not at all, useful to her, right? And so then they got kind of got to work from there. And it was, you know, I think it was sort of painful and uncomfortable for the student to go through, but I think the student ended up getting to a really good place. You know, I think because we're trained so often to feel good about these outputs that um, the idea that there could be friction or there could be discomfort during the process um, is absolutely horrifying. And, you know, I think like a lot of, you know, that's why I say we need to honor the friction of disability because a lot of the work that I do is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me too. Um, but we can't keep thinking, right, that this all feels good because because it doesn't. And if if it all does feel good during the process, then I can assure you that when it rolls out, uh, you know, shit's probably gonna hit the fan. Um, and so again, right, like where do I learn these things? Um, how do I feel about engaging with disabled people, right? Am I thanking them for their feedback? you know, how were my users recruited, right? Did I um, just look for blind people or did I try and expand it and find, um, you know, people for whom visual elements are not, you know, accessible? Um, and again, you know, who am I hoping to impress with this work? So again, this is a list of questions that I'm, you know, more than happy to, um, it's just, it's on Medium and, and I'll make sure that you get the link as well. Um, but I think I'm going to sort of leave my presentation at that. Um, and I'm hoping that I haven't scared you off too much um, and that you might be willing to, um, you know, ask a few questions. Um, you know, I just, I really, my favorite part of any presentation is the Q&A. And so I really hope to get a chance to kind of get to know a couple of you guys and, and uh, chat through some of this. Thank you.